Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're following along, we're in our last study of this series. Uh, we're in chapter 28. Um, we left off in our last study where Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, we're told in chapter 27 that they rolled this great stone over the opening of the tomb. And only, not only did they roll the stone over the opening of the tomb, but they also sealed uh, the, the stone. And what they would do is they took a rope over the span of the stone on both sides of it into the side of the mountain, and they would mortar it to the side of the cave there. Uh, and then they would impress uh, the seal of Caesar uh, to make sure that it was not broken. And um, remember also that if you broke the Roman seal without authorization, you would be killed uh, immediately. And if you broke the seal and you fled uh, and they found out who it was that did it, and it was you, your family would then be tracked down and they would kill your family uh, for breaking that Roman seal without authorization. And you remember that this was not good enough for the Pharisees. And so they went to Pilate and they said, we remember the words of this deceiver referring to Jesus. And he said three days he would rise from the dead. Uh, interesting, the disciples didn't remember what Jesus said, but the enemy of Christ remembers. And so Pilate sent uh, forth a Roman guard at the entrance of the tomb then Pilate tells the Jewish leaders, okay, you now have your watch, you now have your guard, uh, now you make it as secure as you want. Uh, one of the first century historians said about the Roman watch or the Roman guard, uh, quote, a guard was not just one guard, it was a unit of from the Roman legion. This unit was probably one of the greatest offensive and defensive fighting machines ever conceived, end of quote. So understand that uh, you have 16 Roman soldiers who were trained to defend 500 square feet of space against impossible odds, and they would remain at their post until, they, until their, uh, their death. And so you have to be thinking that Jesus's body, his dead body, behind this great rock sealed with the military guard uh, and so forth, that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And likely the next couple of nights, the Pharisees would be able to sleep better and have a little more comfort knowing that uh, the this tomb and Jesus's dead body was going to be guarded by the best of the best of the Roman military. Now, the skeptics would say that Jesus lost his consciousness consciousness on the cross. He actually was not dead. He regained consciousness when they put him in the tomb. He was able to somehow recoup, and then he moved this massive stone that was in front of the, of the, of the grave, and uh, that he was able to sneak past the best military guard without being detected. Now, that's what the skeptics would think. If it was a matter of just the cross, uh, with the hands and the feet, feet uh, pierced, it's probable that the skeptics might have a valid point. We've all been pierced in some way, maybe stepping on a tack or a nail or something of that nature. And uh, as long as it doesn't hit your major organs, you can survive and recover. But remember that the cross was not uh, the only thing that was done. That was the final act after the scourging, and the scourging would... Uh, take uh, the victim to an inch of their life. And one doctor was quoted as saying about the scourging, uh, which Christ went through, uh, quote, the heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across the person's shoulders, back and legs. At first, the heavy uh, throngs cut into the skin only. And then as the, as the blows continue, they continue, they cut deeper into the sub subcutaneous tissues, uh, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and then finally spurting arterial blood from the vessels in the underlying muscles. 
Uh, the small balls of lead produce large and deep bruises, which are then broken up by sub subsequent blows. And then finally, the skin on the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of bleeding tissue. And when it is determined by the centurion that the prisoner is near death, then the beating finally stops, end of quote. So uh, it was the scourging that brought Jesus within inches of his life. And all the cross did was take him to that final inch, so to speak, to his death. Now, Eusebius, who was known as the father of church history, a man who no doubt witnessed many crucifixions, said this, quote, uh, the sufferer's veins were laid bare, the very muscles uh, and bowels of the victim were open to exposures, end of quote. So understand that when Christ took the bread at the, on the night of his betrayal and he said, this is my body ripped and torn and shred for you, he was not being melodramatic. He was not exaggerating in any way. And so here Rome takes Jesus, rips him open. Literally, you can see the inside of his body. And then to finish him off, they nail him to the cross. And then you want to tell me that after uh, he's been in this tomb for three days and three nights, that he's going to move this massive rock and sneak off uh, past a gathering of the best Roman soldiers and escape without anyone knowing? The skeptic's theology is bogus. And so he was, in fact, raised from the dead. And now we have uh, a study of this histor historic event. All right. So uh, if you don't have your Bibles, I'll put the, vi uh, the verses in the box below this video. Press pause, please, and read verse 1, and then press play again. So this would be the Sunday morning, first day of the week. The other Mary would be the mother of James and John. Uh, the last time we saw these two ladies was the end of chapter 7. They were emotionally distraught. Uh, their world had been turned upside down. They're leaning up against this rock. They don't really know what to believe. Now, two guys were responsible for the burial of Jesus Christ. That would be Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. We're told elsewhere in, uh, that these two women, the reason why they're on their way to the tomb is because they want to finish the burial process for Jesus. They wanted to apply the various perfumes, wrappings, and so forth upon Jesus' body. They want to anoint his body. Uh, they were not going uh, down there to, to, to see an empty tomb. They, um, they had a, a, a vision in mind here of finishing the, the uh, tahara, the, the ritual uh, of, uh, of uh, bathing and, and dressing and anointing the body for, uh, for the burial. All right, so press pause now, read verses 2, 3, and 4, and then press play again. In the early church, there was a guy by the name of Justin Martyr. Uh, he was one of the early church fathers. Now, Justin Martyr claimed that he had firsthand knowledge of a letter uh, which was written by Pontius Pilate to Caesar Tiberius. And you remember earlier in our study, we talked about Pilate never being on the good side of Caesar Tiberius. He was always getting into trouble. And he was writing a letter to Tiberius to explain to him the events which had just taken place in and around the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that letter, Pilate claims that he interviewed the soldier who was in charge of this military watch in front of Jesus' tomb. And Pilate asked the soldier, what in the world happened down there? And the soldier answered, I don't know. And then he uses some very interesting language. He says, the earth began to swim. Pretty interesting. The earth began to swim. And that there was a brilliant light like they had never seen before. And he and his brothers in arms, they hit the deck. And he claimed that the phenomenon continued for over one hour. And so here is this... Uh, um, uh, this this uh, this big angel, uh, he leaves the rock away, 
uh, or he heaves, he heaves the rock away. Remember, it was nearly two tons heavy. And then he sits on it and he taunts the best of the best military that Rome has, has to offer. And he taunts them for over an hour while he awaits these two women to show up. Now the angel begins to speak to these two women. So press pause, read verses 5, 6, and 7, and then press play once again. Now look how simple evangelism is. These are the first two witnesses of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you called to? What are you called to be? Um, uh, you're, you're called to be witnesses. You're not called to witness, you're called to be a witness. It's a noun, it's not a verb. Notice the first two witnesses of the resurrection are told what they're told to do. They are not told to go and, and, and sign up to go to seminary. They're not told to go to Bible college. They're not told to take Bible study courses or seminars. They're not to told to take training to be a witness. But rather, notice the two things that they are told to do. He says, number one, come and see, and number two, go and tell. That's it. That's what being a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. Come and see what a life totally committed to Jesus Christ will do for you to your life. And you'd have, you, you have decided that you are going to take the word of God seriously, look and see, what the power of the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Watch how he can put your marriage back together. Watch how he can put relationships back together. And once God has put your life back together, then just go and tell. He doesn't say go and argue. Uh, you can't argue someone into the kingdom. He doesn't say um, uh, you need to have prepared all the answers for skepticism that you're that will find your way uh, you know when you run into a skeptic all you say is I don't know all I know is that I was this way and now I am that way and uh, I am thinking that uh, that can happen in your life too and that's all these women were asked to do come and see and then go and tell now what did they immediately do Press pause now, read verses 8, 9, and 10, and then press play again. Understand who uh, or how, impre how improbable the Gospels really are. If you are going to take uh, a piece of fiction in the first century uh, in Jerusalem, um, this is not the way you would write it. Understand that there was incredible prejudice against women during this time. Christ is using as his first two witnesses of his resurrection, two women. And according to the Mishnah, uh, um, a woman's testimony was suspect. Uh, they said that rather the law be burned than entrust the word of a woman. Very revealing in the first century culture, yet Christ was turning the social norm on its head. He was constantly teaching women. In fact, the very first person who Jesus reveals to that he is the promised Messiah is not only a woman, but it's a woman from Samaria. And now here is Christ using women to be the first witnesses of the resurrection. We don't understand the animosity of the male community in the first century, um, but the Talmud, the, the Talmud speaks very clearly that from a woman uh, is the beginning of all sin, and because of women, we all die. Of course, they're referring back to Eve uh, in, uh, in Genesis. So understand that the group of guys uh, did not uh, go behind closed doors and discuss how they were going to present the Gospels to the public. They didn't make these events up. They are they are revealing that is what I saw. That is what I heard. That is what I experienced. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but this is what I witnessed. And so I'm just writing it down. 
and I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. Now, also notice that he says, all hail or greetings. Uh, this was the common greeting of the day, and this was the first recorded words of the risen Christ. Would we not assume that the first words of the risen Christ might have been something deeply religious or deeply spiritual? And if you put his first words into our vernacular, it might be, hey, what's up? Or, hey, how you doing? Or, hey, what's going on? No doubt these two women are in shock and Jesus is acting like something, you know, nothing strange is going on. A dead guy is now walking and talking and saying, hey, what's going on? How, how real is Jesus Christ? Notice that they grabbed a hold of him. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was raised spiritual, uh, was, was a raised spiritual being. You know, really? You know, these two women grab a hold of him, and we see la uh, later that he says, a spirit like you think I am does not have flesh and bones. I have flesh and bones. You can grab onto Jesus. Uh, he is a glorified man, and in the resurrection, you too will be made just like him. Uh, you're going to have flesh, <coughs> you're going to have flesh and bone, and it's likely that you, the older that you get, the more you're longing for this great reunion that we're going to have with Jesus in heaven. The older we get, the more our family and friends that are going, uh, going there before us, and you begin to miss them. And when you see your loved ones, your grandma, your grandpa, your parents, cousins, God forbid, maybe it's a child that you lost. What kind of reunion is it going to be? Well, you're going to run up to them. You're not going to be, you know, uh, passing right through them like Casper the Friendly Ghost. Uh, but they have fle they'll have flesh and bone, uh, and you'll be able to hug them and kiss them, and you'll be able to walk with them and eat with them, and you're going to have life together there in the kingdom of God, uh, a world without an end. Jesus is real. They are hanging on to him. And Jesus tells them to go back and tell the disciples. Now, they're, they are back in Jerusalem, and now you want to read uh, the next verses. So press pause, read verses 11 through 15, and then press play again. Notice in verse 15 that this is being written here in the Gospel of Matthew. It was written early before the rumors were able to, to, to get out to the streets of Jerusalem. Remember uh, what Matthew did before he became a disciple. He was a tax collector. He worked for the government. And so no doubt he is going to have connections within the government and he's going to come across information um, uh, that none of the other disciples are going to have. And he is the only gospel writer who records this particular event that we're reading about in verses 11 through 15. This should strengthen your faith, actually. Uh, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and if they all had the very same words and the same phraseology, it would take the credibility away uh, of the recorded uh, events because it would be surmised that these guys got together, they agreed on the same story. But the fact is that they're just writing what they saw, they're writing what they heard, they're writing what they experienced, and Matthew did not concern himself about what Mark would have written or Luke or John. He just wrote what he saw and heard. Notice in uh, verse 13, uh, it says, uh, uh, you are, this is the Pharisees talking to, the, to the, um, the guards, the Roman guards, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, how ridiculous of a statement or a story is that? You know, if you're asleep, how do you know what happened? I mean, that's ridiculous. This is an absolute stupid excuse that the chief priest came up with to give to the Roman guard. All right, uh, press pause, read verses 16 and 17, and then press play again. You've got to be thinking to yourselves here, what in the world does Jesus have to do with these disciples for them to believe him. He's pulled thousands of rabbits out of his hat, so to speak, for these guys. He's turned water into wine. He's cursed trees and they instantly die. He's raised people from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. 
Uh, they see the risen Christ, and some of them doubt. But here's the great thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. When he starts his work in your life, he will bring that work to completion. Michelangelo was an incredible artist. He started lots of sculptures, which he never finished. In fact, uh, of all the sculptures that uh, that we have, most of them um, by by Michelangelo were not finished. You can look on, you know, look up uh, online or go to the library, and you'll find a sculpture of Matthew that Michelangelo did that was not finished. Matthew was still. Uh, not quite out of that block of, of marble. Apparently, Michelangelo got bored and he moved on to another project. This should draw great encouragement to you and to me to understand that Jesus is not going to get bored with you. He's not going to get bored with me. He's not going to move on to another project. When you and I are a blockhead, so to speak, a block of marble, the Lord does not give up but rather he continues to work on you. And these, these same guys, these disciples who are doubting the risen Christ, at the end of their lives, what happened? They stood in the final moments of their lives, testifying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ while enduring incredible torture. And they stood strong in their faith, testifying that their witness was truth. Jesus did bring them along. Jesus did perfect them. And Jesus is going to do that very same thing to you and to me. So Jesus then continues. So press pause, read verse 18, and then play once again. Notice the progression of things here. In verse 17, the idea is that Jesus is standing a little bit of a distance away, and some of them are doubting them, but they're worshiping him from a distance. Then notice that he came into their midst, and then he taught them. The Bible tells us, if you go back to Psalm chapter 22 and verse 3, it says, Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. The Lord inhabits those people who praise him, and so at a distance they are praising him. Then he comes into their midst. Notice what he does not say. He doesn't say, well, you know, uh, that I have had an awful lot of power uh, and you know that uh, the devil also has a lot of power, so you better keep your eye on that guy and there's no telling what he's going to do. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, all power is given unto me. How much is all power? Well, if you pile up all the power of the universe and you pile it all up into one place, whatever that looks like to you, all of that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ is getting ready to send these 11 guys out to share the gospel from one end of the Roman Empire to the other. And I'm sure these 11 guys are thinking, I don't think so. And I'd be lucky to get this message at my front door, let alone the ends of the earth. And Jesus is saying, no, no, all the power is given unto me. Notice now what he says in verse 19. So press pause, verse 19, then press play again. We tend to emphasize the word go uh, that's in that verse. This is what he is telling us to do. We need to go, and from the emphasis of the word go, we have so elevated that position uh, um, of, of a missionary in this country that we think that it is the most spiritual thing which one person can do. If you are out on a mission field sharing the gospel of Christ, that is the highest and holiest that you can get. But because you are taking the word of God seriously here, uh, if God calls you to be a missionary in the foreign field, for you, that is the highest calling. But if you're not called to do something like that, that is not your highest calling. The Greek word that Jesus uses here is that in your going, make disciples of all the nations. What does that mean? As you walk through your life, as you do those things that you do in your life, and who knows where your life is going to take you, um, um, you know, we all end up in a box or a vase or perhaps uh, up here in the mountains in the, the belly of a, of a bear. Um, 
Uh, we all know where our life ultimately ends, but in between now and then, you don't know where your life is going to take you. And uh, you have one situation happen and you're off in this direction. You have another situation happen and you're off in another direction. Wherever fate takes you, wherever the hand of destiny takes you, wherever God moves you in your life, be a part of this disciple-making process. That's what it means. Notice that he does not say, I want you to go and make churchgoers. He doesn't say, I want you to go and make pew warmers. He doesn't say, I want you to go and make church attendees. No, but rather, what does he say? I want you to go and make disciples. Now, what does that mean? A disciple is one who is learning after Jesus Christ. And so we are to make disciples. How do we make disciples? Well, Jesus gives us three easy to understand points here. Notice the first thing, baptize them. Well, who do we baptize? The Bible clearly tells us in Mark 16, 16, we are to baptize believers. And so where does discipleship start? It starts by bringing people into a personal introduction to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you lead them in, in some fashion of that Lord's Prayer. For example, you know, Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe your Son is the Savior. Uh, he is the Lord and died for my sins. You raised him from the dead. Please come into my life and change me. Some form of a prayer like that, or you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3, 4, and 5, and you can see a clear outline of that prayer, some form of that prayer. And then we take you as a public display of your profession of faith, baptize you. So baptizing begins with our part of introducing people to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You, can, you cannot make a learner of Christ out of someone who does not know Christ. So the first is that they have to know who Christ is. Then step two and three, now in verse 20. So press pause, read verse 20, and then press play once again. All right, the second thing is that we are to, uh, that we, we teach. We don't preach, we teach people. And what is it that we are to teach? We are to teach them the doctrine of the apostles. Jesus is taking, is talking to the 11, and he's saying, I want you to go and I want you to teach people that which I have taught to you. In Acts chapter 2, we read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, the apostles' doctrine has been handed down to us for almost 2,000 years now. We hold that on our laps if we're holding a Bible in our laps. It's the form of the Bible, the Word of God. So bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that does not end their spiritual journey, but rather it begins their spiritual journey. And then we begin to teach them the Word of God. Then step three, we are to teach them to ultimately observe it themselves. In other words, uh, we are causing them to be doers of the word rather than just learners or hearers of the word. And you can see that in the book of James chapter 1 verse 22. We are not to just study the word, but we are to claim the word of God into our lives. And we are impressing those actions into our heart so that we, uh, uh, to, to those who we are teaching. The church in the United States is doing a terrible job in the area of discipleship. And the reason is that we're no longer teaching the word of God word by word or line by line or precept by precept, but rather we're offering the general public uh, uh, entertainment with a thin veneer of spirituality. Christianity is on a sharp decline in the United States. And we as a nation have brought into this idea that we can keep the, uh, the silent majority so that one day we can be a witness for Christ. And that's a failing strategy. And every statistic will support the fact that that's a failing strategy. 85% uh, of American churches are on a numeric decline. 
There are less people this year attending church than one year ago. 18% of American Americans attend church on a regular basis. Well, what does that mean? It means that 82% are not attending church regularly. 94% of high school graduates leave the faith within two years after their graduation. This is why it's not a good idea to entertain the people who, who attend church. Uh, it's not a good idea to spend money on media centers so you can captivate attention. We're failing when it comes to discipling young people in our churches. There are now two times the number of non-believers and atheists in America as there are evangelical Christians. And all you have to do is to get your head out of the sand and see that they are working over time to erase from our history any understanding of the uh, Christian roots. Every plaque of the Ten Commandments is being ripped down across America. When they find a cross in the public, they are ripping it down. If your child or grandchild begins to, to uh, bring a Bible uh, to school, they're labeled as a freak and they're ostracized. The non-believers and the atheists do not want to hear anything to do with Jesus Christ. There is an incredible animosity, and this should remind us of what happened in the pre-Nazi Germany uh, uh, era. Uh, you know, a broken window here and a broken window there, a little bit of graffiti here and there. I can get away with this, I can get away with that. And before you know it, you've got people filled in boxcars being taken to uh, death camps to be exterminated. And that's exactly what's materializing right now in our country. Now, where does all of this animosity come from? When, when asked to rate 11 groups in terms of respect, non-Christians rated evangel evangelicals at the number 10 spot. So second to last, only prostitutes rated lower than evangelical uh, Christians. But that should not be uh, a, a shock to any of us. The non-believers and the atheists have a very low view of who you and I uh, believe, uh, that you and I who believe in the word of, of God. Why do they believe that? Well, Barna Research looked at 70 moral behaviors and did not did not find any difference between the actions of those who were born again, that's Christians, and the actions of those who are non-Christians. In other words, evangelicals, uh, up to 7% of the population, but about 20% of them, 20% uh, 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 of the women uh, are, are having abortions, identifying themselves as e evangelical Christians. Now, the way you and I are being perceived because we are not making disciples, but rather we are making church attenders. If you are a church attender and you're going to live however you want, but when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are constantly being challenged by the word. You're constantly being challenged by the spirit. You're constantly being challenged by your brothers and sisters in Christ to be a better person. We're no longer being challenged. What we're getting is a constant flow of entertainment, and the fruit of that activity is the production of a very shallow, a very hypocritical Christian in this world today. And as a result, we as the church are receiving disrespect, and we're not impacting the culture for Jesus Christ. The statistics show that today, somehow around the world, every 25 minutes, 3,000 people are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That means by tomorrow, this very same time, that 175,000 souls are going to be saved for the kingdom of God. Christianity is exploding in the East. In the 1960s, over 70% of the church was in Western Europe and North America. Here we are 50 years later, and 75% of the church is growing in the East and 25% in Western Europe and North America. Christianity began in the east, then it traveled westward, and now it's moving westward and saying goodbye to the shores of America. History is being changed. Christianity is spreading like wildfire everywhere else in the world except the United States. Why is that? Could it be that our eastern brothers are taking seriously more uh, on their approach to the word of God and salvation and their relationship with Jesus Christ than what you and I are here in the United States. Jesus looked 
at his relationship with all of humanity regarding salvation as being so serious that he allowed himself to be ripped open through scourging. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He died for you. He raised himself once again for you because he takes his relationship with you and me seriously. Are you taking your relationship with Jesus Christ seriously? If so, then take the word of God seriously. Jesus said here in this uh, chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, therefore go out, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I, I'm will, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. All right. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Thank you for viewing and good day.